Um, so before we get started, just to say once again, thank you to all the organizers um, before, during, and after the event. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. Um, so yeah, my name is Joseph Bilgeis. Um, they say you should get to know your audience. Um, so I'm gonna start with just a couple of questions for you all. Who here is a free and open source software developer? It's pretty much everyone, and then I'm gonna assume uh, the same answer to this question will be yes. Who here is a free and open source software user? Okay, and who here is involved with free software because you believe that user autonomy and transparency are fundamental for a healthy digital society? Okay, pretty much everyone here, good. Um, I have a lot of slides that I'm gonna cover today. I may not get through all of them, that's okay. Um, if you want, there's a lot of uh, links and resources that are cited. You can download the slides at our um, uh, GitLab repository. I will return to this slide at the very end of the talk. So I'm gonna to start today by <clears throat> thinking about what KDE, um, KDE's vision is. Um, so KDE started, as Alesh pointed out earlier today, about 26 years ago, um, just celebrated the 25th anniversary in October of 2021. Um, and um, nowadays it's much more than just a desktop environment. Um, there are uh, multiple uh, cross-platform apps, um, international community of developers, and um, a few years ago there was discussion in the community of what the vision of KDE is for the future. And this is what, what uh, the community came up with. So a world in which everyone has control over their digital life and enjoys freedom and privacy. And I want to unpack this phrase just a little bit. Um, with the goal of um, convincing you in the audience that um, part of that vision should be extended to enjoying freedom, privacy, and a sustainable uh, uh, future um, with the responsible use of our shared resources. So the first part of the phrase, a world in which everyone has control over their digital life. At the website, um, they break down each word um, and uh, here, they describe the control as we don't want a handover control to anybody else. KDE wants to put you in the driver's seat. And how are they gonna do that? How are we gonna do that? Um, we're gonna do it by developing free and open source software, free user autonomy, open source transparency and accessibility for everyone. That's how we uh, achieve um, control. Um, and as a consequence of free and open source software, um, we as users and uh, everyone in um, the world can, can enjoy freedom and privacy. Um, the website states, without the freedom to make changes and share them, users are entirely reliant on the vendor's benevolence for apparent control. So with non-free software, you might be given options of where to click, um, but in the end, it's the developers and the companies behind it that are gonna decide what actually happens. If you don't like what's happening, um, you have uh, little choice. Um, privacy is, uh, uh, transparency is fundamental uh, for privacy. Um, many of you know Kirchhoff's principle, the idea that a cryptographic system is only as secure, um, is, is secure when all uh, uh, parts of the system are transparent except for the private key. Um, so the user autonomy and transparency are what give us freedom and privacy. And these uh, transparency and user freedom aren't features, they're not offered by the companies, they're inherent to the software itself. The rest of my talk is gonna be taking these two pillars of free and open source software, that is transparency and user autonomy and I wanna convince you of a couple of things. First, that it already puts free and open source software at the forefront of sustainable software design. Um, it's not just me saying this, um, using the German government Blue Angel Eco Label as a benchmark, um, the award criteria for eco-certifying software recognizes these two values as being critical for uh, sustainable software design. Um, Beyond the uh, uh, eco-certification and compliance with an award criteria, we can do a lot more with free software. Um, you can help, you can measure your application 
get an idea of what the energy consumption is of your software. I'm gonna talk about that in the second half of the talk, how to do that. I'm gonna to focus today on desktop software. Um, you can join our sprints. Uh, we're gonna set up a community lab uh, in May in Berlin. If you are in Berlin or want to come to Berlin, be in touch. Um, you can collaborate with us at our mailing list or a matrix room, um, among other things, which I'll come back to at the very end. Um, first, to get an idea of what the issues are. So this is a report uh, from a report from October from the Association for Computing Machinery. Um, it's one of the oldest associations of its kind from 1947. And they released a technology policy council report in which they estimate that the ICT sector contributes between 1.8% and 2.8% greenhouse, uh, global greenhouse emissions. Um, as a point of comparison, the global aviation industry um, is estimated to be about 2.5%, so we're in the same general area. This number is growing. They estimate if nothing is done, by uh, 2050, it will be a, a third of global greenhouse emissions will be coming from the ICT sector. This is from a report from a French nonprofit um, which is uh, seeking to minimize our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, this is from 2017. Um, and it's a breakdown of the energy consumption of different aspects of uh, digitization. Um, in this data, they're not calculating transportation and end of life processing like recycling. Um, the top uh, right uh, part of the, the um, pie chart shows production for TVs, computers, others, um, and smartphones, um, so other uh, um, IoT devices. Um, on the bottom left, we have usage, data centers, networks, and terminals. Terminals is referring to all of our devices, uh, computers, smartphones, TVs, et cetera. Um, in today's talk, so, so one thing you'll notice, production is about 45%, or actually it is 45% with these numbers, and usage is 55%. Again, not including transportation. Um, in the talk today, I'm only going to refer to things that are relevant for production. So this 45% here, terminals, the 20% here, and I'm gonna make reference to some network energy consumption. Um, I'm not gonna talk about data centers, and as someone asked earlier at lunch, I'm not gonna talk about Bitcoin um, and the blockchain. Um, Is, is, is that number covered in the percentages? Um, it should be, but I actually don't know offhand. Um, I can look that up though and let you know if you talk to me later. Um, and I wanna point out the French nonprofit, um, uh, the SHIFT project uh, notes that the two main drivers of the energy consumption in this pie chart is from um, short uh, lifespan of our devices um, and videos. So video streaming, video conferences, and this is from 2017, so this probably looks a little different today after the pandemic. So I'm gonna talk about three um, aspects of energy consumption today. Energy efficiency, um, which is uh, referring to um, having the same result but requiring less from the hardware. Um, I'm also gonna talk about energy conservation um, that is eliminating unnecessary processes that uh, um, require energy. Um, and energy sources, um, maximizing renewable energy sources. So here is a bar plot from the German Environment Agency comparing different software products in terms of their energy consumption when doing the same thing. I'm not gonna, fo I'm not gonna look at the right part of the plot, I'm only gonna focus on these two bar plots here. Um, this is comparing two word processors, again, doing the exact same thing. Um, as you can see from the plot, word processor one, this light green plot, consumes four times the energy than word processor two um, to achieve the same result. They don't publish uh, the names of the software products um, that, are, uh, um, that the word processor one is and word processor two is. Um, they do, uh, in the Blue Angel Award criteria, uh, define uh, software bloat, and I think it's uh, good to think about in terms of these numbers. Um, as the availability of more and more powerful hardware 
has resulted in software becoming more and more bloated from version to version so that more resources are required for only minimal or even no enhancement of the functionality. And I think this quantifies that. It's at the same exact um, uh, time to the end result. So these are uh, based on what are called standard usage scenarios, which I will talk about a little bit in the second half of the talk in how to measure energy consumption of desktop software, um, where you emulate a, um, a user's behavior representing typical functions um, that a user might uh, do, um, uh, and you do it 30 times and then uh, yeah, um, do some statistics on those numbers. So. Um, so when growing up, um, I was always taught to think, uh, when, when it came to uh, ecological issues, think global, act local. Um, and I wanted to uh, use this, ex this example from a, um, it's from an online course. Um, this is from Detloff Toms. Um, the title is Sustainable Programming at SAP. Um, and I adapted a little bit um, to fit this context. Um, so this is an example of, of um, what I'm calling acting, acting locally, so in the European Union context for the people who are um, based out of the EU. Um, of course, local might be different for different people here. Um, so uh, in this example, uh, uh, it's claimed that, I, uh, that okay, so we're going to look at the yearly savings for one worker um, when saving just one, P, one CPU second on a process. Uh, the estimation is that one CPU second reduction would mean a 10 watt second reduction per transaction. And if you imagine 20 transactions per day for 230 workdays, um, this is about 46,000 uh, watt second savings. Okay. This isn't very much for an individual. I think it's about 15 minutes of a 50 watt light bulb. The thing about software, though, is that these numbers are quickly multiplied. So in the EU context, where there's about 500 million people, it's a little less than that today, but um, these are easy numbers to work with. Um, and it's estimated that 2% of uh, users use uh, GNU Linux in the market share of, of desktop um, software. And just for the sake of uh, um, num thinking about the numbers and making it concrete, let's imagine that a fourth of them are using Ocular, the PDF reader. I'm not saying that is the actual number, I'm just uh, I'm using that as an example. That would equal, in the EU alone, uh, 2.5 million users, um, which would be about 32 megawatt hours of savings. This is for one CPU second reduction. Okay. Um, those numbers, again, an idea of what that means. Um, I looked up online what one megawatt hour um, uh, is equivalent to, and I found that it's uh, about 6,000 kilometers uh, with an electric vehicle. Um, 32 megawatt hours would be like a, a trip from Paris to Beijing in an, in an electronic vehicle and back 11 times. Okay, so these numbers quickly add up. And this is only in the context of the EU. Um, if I can convince 300 uh, Linux App Summit developers um, here and online um, to achieve 10 of those optimizations, we're talking about 96,000 megawatt hours, which would be roughly the annual power consumption of 30,000 30, two-person households, okay, the size of a small city. Okay, so that's the context of energy efficiency. I'm going to come back to this in a, in a minute. Um, thinking of energy processes, so energy conservation. Um, I'm going to talk about this in two parts. Um, this is from a presentation at the CCC in 2019 um, from Marina Kern and Eva Kahn. Um, and they're presenting some of the research that actually is the foundation for the Blue Angel um, eco label. Um, it's a great talk if you um, want to check it out. Um, I'm going to, again, looking at two word processors here. Um, I'm going to focus on everything that happens after this red line. This red line is the point at which a document is saved in the text editor. What you can see here is that there's a bump in the energy consumption for this text editor, and then it goes idle. It's not doing anything um, beyond um, what it's been asked to do. Um, if you compare that to the other text editor, there's a bump, and then it continues doing things. Um, what it's doing is not clear. Um, is it telemetry? Um, are there other things happening in the background? Um, 
one of the questions would be, is this necessary for the functionality of the software? Um, do users have a choice if this is happening or not? Okay, the second part that I'm gonna talk about in terms of energy conservation um, is in terms of software-driven hardware obsolescence. Um, so some of you may have had this happen uh, to, since you're Linux users, uh, maybe not to you, but to family members or friends. Um, where they're being pushed to an update um, for perhaps even a laptop that's not that old, and they're given the warning that this device doesn't meet minimum system requirements. And they're confronted with the question, do I continue using this laptop with potentially an out-of-date operating system, um, or do I buy a new one? Um, also, this is very common. Device is no longer supported. Um, you no longer get uh, security updates uh, for that device, um, rendering this, this hardware um, obsolete. The result is that you have new devices produced and shipped unnecessarily, and functioning devices discarded as e-waste. Remember, the energy consumption of uh, the um, digital infrastructure was about 45% of the total energy consumption in that pie chart. Um, this is a big part of that. Um, for many of these devices, the production and transportation uh, the energy consumption for the production and transportation of the devices um, far out, uh, uh, exceeds the usage of the device itself. Um, many of you probably know this. This is the waste electrical and electronic equipment person, the we person. Um, it's a statue made out of uh, discarded uh, uh, electronic uh, equipment um, representing the um, uh, waste from an average UK citizen's uh, lifetime. Um, it's seven meters tall um, and is 3.3 tons. Um, and the final thing I'm going to talk about today are energy, energy sources. Um, this is a, a representation of um, energy supply on the y-axis and time of day on the x-axis. You can see there's a base load of energy that's supplied by uh, renewable energy sources. Um, by the way, you can get data like this um, from, for Europe, and I'm sure for other places as well, from this link here. Um, you can see that at certain times of day, uh, there's more energy being supplied by renewable sources, uh, meaning a reduction in uh, CO2 emissions, um, than at other times of day. Um, I just want to point out that uh, there is a, on the south wall of this building, it's all photovoltaic uh, cells, um, and they are actually generating energy in this building. Um, you can see some data at the entrance when you walk in. Um, I also wanted to point out, I forgot to do this, that um, there's a, actually a, an exhibit, a photography exhibit here in Rovereto. I only happened to see it yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to see it, um, about uh, the ecological and social costs of uh, the uh, mining that's needed to produce uh, electronic devices. So if you're here for a couple of days, it goes until the 10th of May um, in the city center of Rovereto. Might be worth checking out. Okay, so, um, okay, energy efficiency, conservation sources, what about FOSS? So, so far I've only talked about the problems, now let's get to where free and open source software fits into this picture. Um, so I'm gonna start with the observation that FOSS is inherently socially oriented and empowers users and communities through user autonomy and transparency being inherent to it. Um, and given this, uh, the user autonomy and transparency, we are empowered to find new and creative ways to improve software sustainability um, for this and future generations and future species, or not future species, for species in the future. So hopefully that you know, the GNUs and the penguins um, and the geckos are not just cute logos for great software, um, but are still animals that we can um, see and uh, um, have a part of our ecosystem in the future. So, um, transparency. So one of the things I want to um, emphasize here is extending the idea of transparency from the source code to also the energy consumption. Um, this is one of the goals of the Blue Angel, um, that if you are compliant with the Eco Certification Award criteria, you are transparent about how much energy your software consumes. This is the first step um, for anything that we want to do in terms of energy efficiency. We need to know how much uh, energy our software is consuming. Once we know how much energy we're consuming, first users are informed and are able to make choices. If I know that the word processors that I'm using have a difference of four times the energy when using it, 
um, I might choose uh, the ecologically friendly software. Um, and I can only do that once I know what the numbers are. Um, as developers, once you have these numbers, you can think about how you can drive down the energy consumption of the software you're developing. Um, efficiency, I just want to point out, can also come in many forms. There's a nice example from just a couple of weeks ago from KDE. Um, the e-learning software, G Compris, um, has, um, so they wanted to in increase the resolution of the images they use. It's a very uh, image-based uh, software. Um, and um, they discovered that if they uh, changed the formats of the images they were using from JPEG and PNG to, to WebP, they were able to increase the resolution and um, increase the data efficiency. So their application um, was reduced in size by 30% just by this one change. Um, this has also a direct uh, influence on energy consumption when you think about the download, the internet uh, um, um, uh, energy consumption of the, of the infrastructure need to download the software is going to be reduced the smaller it is. Um, and you know, for people who are using this software in places where internet connections aren't great, um, it makes it easier to then access. Um, this is uh, the, one of the main developers that wrote about this on the KDE Eco blog, um, which if you're interested, you can go check it out. Um, so I, I, I said, you know, we can act local, and I gave the example that ended up with um, a 30,000 two-person household energy savings in the EU. Um, of course, the EU is one part of the world, and what's nice about software is that you can act local and you can act global. Software is used everywhere. Um, with those changes, um, this one CPU second uh, with 100, uh, 300 developers, um, et cetera, um, you can multiply that by 16 times the energy savings globally. Um, that's about the size of Liverpool um, in terms of this uh, 30,000 two-person households multiplied by 16. So that's a, you know, a city of uh, energy savings that we can do as um, free software developers. And we can push a global conversation. One of the nice things about having an official eco-label is that um, we're now pushing other developers to think about being transparent about the energy consumption of their software. So if we start measuring our software and publishing and making this a part of software development, um, we can then hopefully force other people to start thinking about these things and also publishing their data. Um, going back to these unnecessary processes, So we don't know which software products these are. Um, if this were free software, or if it's free software, we could change this. We can look at the source code, see what it's doing after it saves, and remove those processes, or at least give users the option to opt out, or better yet, um, to have it off by default and have users opt in. That's the official policy of KDE. Uh, no telemetry is done without users actually saying they want it to be done. Right? This has uh, effects in the energy consumption of the software we're using. And finally, this is, you know, one aspect of this talk is that free and open source software is already at the forefront of sustainable software design. We take this for granted. Um, I think, you know, probably many of you, many of you in here use devices um, that are beyond the, uh, uh, the software life of the official developers. Um, I know talking with uh, one of the um, developers here for smartphone apps um, using a device that's uh, over seven years old. Um, this is definitely in the uh, and the general population an exception, but I think in the free and open source software computer, this, uh, community, this is quite common. Um, you know, we can give users a choice uh, to continue using their hardware if they want. This can have huge effects on the um, energy consumption of producing and transporting um, devices unnecessarily. Um, and we can, we can demand more, and I would say we must demand more. Um, last week on Wednesday, there was an open letter that was published from the Upcycling Android project of the Free, Sof Free Software Foundation Europe. Um, KDE is one of the signatories, um, as are several other projects. It would be great if every project here um, was a signatory on this open letter, um, demanding that users have the right to choose operating systems and software running on their devices. Right? This can have huge effects when you have the hardware locked down, you don't have a choice. Um, if we can open this up, then users are given um, real choice. 
by doing so, maybe we can, my, sorry, my graphic design uh, skills are not that great. Um, maybe we can shrink the, the Wii statue um, and make it, instead of seven meters tall, make it much smaller. Um, and then finally, when thinking about the, um, that certain times of day offer uh, opportunities to maximize renewable energy sources, um, we can think about shiftable tasks. Um, so I hadn't thought of this, but we were talking at lunch today about um, a lot of academic research uh, can run very computationally expensive models. Um, things like that can be maybe moved to certain times of day to maximize use of energy resources. For us as uh, FOSS um, users and developers, perhaps we can think about how we incorporate information that's available about energy sources into shiftable tasks like updates. If we can move updates to certain times of day or encourage people to do it at certain times of day, perhaps we're minimizing our CO2 emissions um, uh, when doing those tasks. Um, so I mentioned that um, free and open source software, um, the values of free and open source software of transparency and user autonomy are now officially recognized as being critical for sustainable software design. Um, the German Environment Agency, or Umweltbundesamt, um, through the Blue Angel Eco uh, uh, label, um, has uh, officially recognized these values as being fundamental. Um, this has been the uh, uh, inspiration for the KDE Eco Initiative, which is made up of two projects, um, the Free and Open Source Energy Efficiency Project and the Blaue Engel for FOSS Project. Um, the Free and Open Source Energy Efficiency Project is about energy measuring, uh, measuring energy consumption, among other things. Um, I want to point out, although this is in the KDE tent, this is a, a free and open source software um, oriented project. We want to get as many FOSS projects involved as possible. Um, the Blau Angle for FOSS is more specifically related to the uh, Blue Angel Eco Certification. That's the project that I'm working for, which is a government funded project. And um, that's what I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the talk talking about. Um, who here knows the Blue Angel? And maybe I can ask, what do you know it for? It's so toilet paper was the answer. So m most commonly in the, in the context of Germany, people know the Blue Angel because it's certified paper products, in particular toilet paper products. I actually thought about starting this talk about who knows what toilet paper and software have in common. Um, they have in common that they're both now uh, potentially eco-certified by the Blue Angel. Um, the Blue Angel is the oldest eco-label in the world. Um, 1978 is when it began. And it um, is internationally recognized and it's backed by the German government. Um, they certify many products. Um, as of 2020, they now certify desktop software. They want to uh, um, expand um, into other areas like uh, mobile software and um, distributed uh, um, um, energy consumption like client server software and other sort of peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, the eco-label is made up of three different categories, um, resource and energy efficiency. When you think back to those bar plots where one had four times the energy consumption, that's what they're referring to here. Um, potential hardware operating life, um, you have to meet a minimum requirement of uh, supporting devices at least five years, which is nothing. Um, I think that could be much higher, personally. Um, and user autonomy criteria, which gives users the ability to influence the factors that um, drive up energy consumption. I'm going to look at that in a bit more detail. Um, before uh, going into each of these, I just want to point out FOSS has a real advantage um, given this emphasis on user autonomy um, and hardware operating life. Um, everything below the this, um, you know, bright red text here saying that criteria FOSS is already fulfilling. We just need documentation. Um, free and open source software already does most of these things. Support for energy saving modes. That's just documentation of the minimum system requirements. We run on, um, most of our software runs on hardware that's at least five years old. Um, then the user autonomy cr criteria, which is perhaps the most interesting. Things like, can you uninstall the software? This, again, we might take this completely for granted. Um, not all software can be uninstalled on a device. Um, uh, modularity, can you only install what you need and not uh, more? Um, documentation of support for open standards, um, privacy policies, things like this. Transparency is a big part of it. Um, 
are the APIs um, um, depend on open standards? Um, if you discontinue support for that software, will you open source it so other people can continue support of it? If you want to be certified, you have to fulfill that criteria, or at least have some sort of plan for after the life cycle of that software. Um, will there be continu continuity of support, security updates, et cetera? Um, does it run offline? Um, and can users opt out of uh, advertisement and things like this? To get the Blue Angel, you have to fulfill these. FOSS has a clear advantage here. So the rest of my talk, since I think the rest of that is pretty much a given, is going to be focused on hardware performance and energy consumption. Um, and there are basically three steps, given that we already fulfill so much of the criteria um, because we're free and open source. Um, the three steps are measure, analyze, and certify to give it a nice um, catchy uh, three-step process. Um, this is a graph from our season of KDE student um, who worked on the um, uh, standard usage scenarios. Um, so measuring means you have to uh, develop a usage scenario representing typical use of the software. Analyze, use a tool like OSCAR. It's the open source software consumption analysis in R tool developed by the Umwelt Campus. Um, and, uh, and then fulfill the documentation and then um, eco-certify your software. So the lab setup um, it looks like this. Um, here we have um, the system that we're testing. Um, and if you want to do Blue Angel Eco Certification, they have recommendations for which operating systems to use. If you want to do it on a free and open source software operating system, Ubuntu is what's recommended. Um, this is connected to an external power meter, um, as well as a, another device that's collecting the data and is then used for the um, analysis. Um, Power meters can get very expensive. Um, the one that's recommended by the Blue Angel is about 300, 350 euro. Uh, talking with um, uh, a Volker earlier, um, there are uh, power meters that are way more expensive than that. Um, uh, Volker has hacked a cheap power plug to act as a power meter, um, and he's written about it on his blog. Um, if you're interested in, in setting up a home lab, um, this scales very easily. Um, they cost about, the power plugs cost about eight euro, 10 euro. Um, and you can get um, um, a, a resolution of, of about uh, a measurement every 200 milliseconds. Um, so about five measurements per second. Um, a professional power meter gets about a thousand measurements per second, um, but doesn't give you a lower time resolution. At least the ones that are recommended that we are planning to use also in our lab. So here's an example of a power meter, um, the Gouda Expert Power Control. Um, also collect data about hardware performance. Um, so a free and open source software tool would be Collectal, um, which can do this. Uh, and it collects CPU, memory, disk, and network data. Um, CPU is actually a very good indicator of power consumption. Um, they correlate very nicely. And there are three scenarios that need to be measured. Um, a baseline mode, which is the operating system um, when it's on, not doing anything. Um, idle mode, which would be opening the software that you want to test, but not doing any, anything with that software to see what the base consumption is of that software. Um, and then the standard usage scenario, which is emulating user behavior. Um, standard usage scenarios, as I've already mentioned, should represent typical and frequent functions. There are various emulation tools that are available. Um, the one that's uh, quite popular right now in the KDE Eco community is XDo tool. This is for X11. Um, uh, using XDo tool in a bash script um, can emulate uh, user behavior. Um, Axiona is a more uh, click and point based emulation tool, which will um, work well if you're using the exact same uh, pixel coordinates. If you change uh, resolutions or monitors, then you have problems. Um, GNU XNI was uh, tested by our Season of KDE student, Karen Jot Singh. Um, you can read about it on his blog post. Um, David Herka, a KDE community me member, has also uh, provided an overview of tools, which is available at our uh, GitLab repository. And just a note that currently these are freely selected uh, actions. Um, it may be in the future that they standardize these, but at, the, at, the, at this time, you can choose what actions you want to represent. Um, you have to be transparent about it and publish it, of course. Um, analysis, there's this tool that's already available. Um, developed by the Umwelt Compass. You need a log file of actions, energy consumption data, hardware performance. You upload it. Uh, you get a nice um, uh, graph. 
of the uh, results. This is for K-mail. Um, these spikes here are, for example, when sending an email, um, you have a, a, a spike in the power consumption. Um, and you need to do it many times in order to get valid statistical results. So you're not just getting noise, um, but you can get an idea of the signal. Right? So once you've done those, th those uh, measurement and analysis steps, um, the rest is just documentation, and then you can submit and certify your software. Um, we're very proud to announce um, that Albert's work on Ocular um, and the other uh, Ocular developers um, have been officially recognized for uh, um, uh, ecological software design. Yeah, it's a round, a round of applause. So this, this was in February. Uh, we made the uh, official announcement in March. Um, it actually opened up some nice channels to talk about free software and sustainability. Um, it was reported in various places uh, at the University of the Umwelt Campus, uh, the uh, German newspaper, TATS, um, FSFE, of course, and that's Politik, Linux Magazine, Hacker News, and then there's a magazine called Transform that's gonna have an article about it, um, perhaps more once we have the official Umwelt Bundesamt event where politicians will shake uh, developers' hands and um, have uh, photos taken. Um, we have other software from KDE that's been measured and analyzed and we're preparing applications for K-Mail. Krita has been measured. We want to have a measure-a-thon uh, to measure uh, G-Compris, Kate, and if you have a project that you want to measure, please be in touch. Uh, we would love to, to include you in our measure-a-thon. And I'm going to skip over um, this so that we have time to talk quickly, but I just want to mention that um, we're setting up a, a measurement lab in, on uh, May 21st. Everyone's invited to join us. Um, if you're in Berlin, if you're not in Berlin, um, and you want to join, please be in touch. Perhaps we have funds to support you. And eventually we want to have an upload portal. This is the grand vision where people can upload their software, upload their usage scenario, and then get a report automatically. We need people to help us um, develop these tools. If you're interested in the topic, please be in touch. Um, there's many ways to get involved and we would love to have you involved. So I'm gonna stop there. So there's a few minutes for, convers for uh, questions. We do have two minutes for questions. Just very briefly, uh, one of the main problems I've seen with certification and open source is that certification typically picks one comment. Like how, how you, do you deal with this? That's a very good question, and this is one of the things that the, actually the criteria is, is, is pretty unclear about how to deal with this for especially free and open source software projects where you have regular commits. Um, at the moment, um, so we don't have a clear idea of how to deal with this. You, you are supposed to re-measure your software with updates. Um, and there is a requirement that it can't increase in energy consumption by 10% from the time that it was certified. Um, there is no clear way that this is supposed to be dealt with at the moment. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that, that question, but it's a very good question. And it's something that for the new criteria that they want to revise for software, that if people here are interested in this and you want to give feedback to the Umwelt Bundesamt, they want feedback. How do we deal with this um, question when it comes to free and open source software? Other questions? Yes, right there. Uh, this is not a real question, but I think it's important. Uh, anyway, uh, a couple of con con considerations. The graph you showed earlier, the, um, uh, about the uh, um, production or renewable energy, it, it can be misleading because uh, it, there is no direct uh, um, um, connection of timetable and production because uh, you can actually uh, lower the power consum consumption during the night instead of the day because of very complicated matter that we can discuss in another place. And another question is, you don't really have, I think, have um, measurement tools because there are many other ways to uh, measure the, um, uh, estimate the power consumption from the CPU load and disk load, you, you can estimate uh, the consumption with that. And with that uh, aim, you can probably 
develop some tools to measure your application without having to have an actual power meter at hand. And that, I think, should be a good approximation for your optimization or your apps and really much uh, feasible, uh, more, much more uh, doable yeah. for any, anyone. And for users to measure, because you can have the f much more feedback if users can uh, uh, measure the power consumption and uh, commit their results. Uh, uh, so this is just a suggestion to how to do that in uh, another way. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank do you. you yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I good, just have a very quick suggestion. response just to say that software-based tools are definitely um, worth uh, using. Um, they are estimates, and I understand that they're not as precise as what you can get with an external um, power uh, uh, meter, but um, absolutely. And there are other indicators, things like CPU usage, if you look at power consumption and CPU usage, they really are very correlated. So unfortunately, if there's other questions, I think it'll have to be done in the break, and I would love to talk with any of you if you're interested, so please um, approach me. I'm a pretty nice guy most of the time. Um, so please Doesn't bite, is energy yeah. efficient. What more can we say? Give him a hand. I've got a little. <laughs> <laughs>